Thank you very much, Rosie. And uh, I see we're running a tight ship here. We're right on the nose on time, so I better, better keep an eye on my watch. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and uh, it's, it's a double pleasure um, having the conference and being in one of my favorite buildings in, in London, um, here at the RIBA. Um, I think we've had some, some very interesting points that have been raised already today um, on the issue of, of craft and collaboration. I just wanted to pick up on a few of those before I, I move on uh, with my presentation. One was um, that came from, from Rosie was talking about how, we could, how it's important to give skills to young people and young people being, being the future for, for craft. And also, uh, Minister Vasey was also extending on that and talking about bringing in uh, cultural education to our schools. And I think that's hugely important, that we don't just look at what ha what's happening in terms of professional practice and what's where the industry itself is going, but how craft can add to, uh, to our education system in many, many ways. And Moira, I was very interested with her point where she was picking up on the importance of cultural diversity. And I think, again, this is something that we often look at and think about, but actually seeing it and instigating it, I think there is a huge amount there. We've started to see some things happening, but I think that there's also a lot of ground to cover there as well in, in terms of, of craft nationally and internationally. And uh, yes, also the, the, the other issue that she mentioned was isolation, which I've, I've got very strong views on as well, having spent three years in Australia. Uh, I saw a lot of isolation there in terms of practitioners and, and makers, and so a lot of the, the difficulty of uh, geographical isolation there. Anyway, so, so far, lots of exciting things here, so I shall um, move on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the collaborative values across disciplines, and really, I suppose, one of the quotes that comes to mind on collaboration is Charles Eames when he was talking to uh, the American Society of Craftspeople and I think it was 1959 he was talking to them and he said that really in terms of collaboration and he was talking about collaboration with industry of course being Eames and he was saying that mutual understanding will do much for both it would help building up a feeling of craft in industry to industry and the craftsmen and society's benefit. And I quite liked the fact that he also recognized at that point the, ben the wider benefit, not just to the industry, but to our culture and to society as well. And I think that that is, that is still very true today. And one of the questions that I would, uh, I would raise is, are we any closer to bringing together that benefit to society and what is the value? What is the nature of the value? Is it simply monetary value or is it a social, is it um, an environmental and cultural value? And I would argue that it is all of these things independently and also interlinked between one another because none of these exist in isolation. They all, there's all sorts of uh, crossovers between them as, as values that we need to take into account. Um, I would also ask if, if craft is bringing a value in terms of our move away from globalization and a way of helping our manufacturing industry remain in this country. Because when manufacturing, when the ability to make goes away in whatever small or large shape and form, it's virtually impossible to get it back. It's really, really tough to do that. So where you see skills going out of a country being replaced by cheaper imports, that leads to real problems in, even in the short term, not just in the medium or long term. And then a third question I would raise on that is, is technology increasingly necessary to uh, prevent the demise of certain skills? So are we just as reliant on technology and on industry uh, as for as industry is becoming on craft, other values for both. So I, I guess in terms of values uh, and reason to collaborate, we've got cultural, we've got social, environmental and economic. We've got all of these different reasons to collaborate and all of them bring different benefits and have, we have different notions of, of value. So I think just as there is a huge discussion about what is craft and how, how extensive 
uh, our definition of craft can be. It's also worth bearing in mind that actually our definition of what the value is, what the benefit is, is also one that is increasingly open and um, that's what we're going to look at today. So. Um, so first of all, I want to look a little bit at some of the, uh, the cultural um, value of collaboration. And this is um, an Irish maker called Joe Hogan. And this is a, a collaboration that he did. His work is on the left. He does these fabulous baskets. Some of them are quite small and intimate, and then others are very large scale. So he really pushes the idea of, of what uh, basket making is. And he's collaborated with the fashion designer Joanne Haynes, for her autumn winter 2011 um, catwalk show. And she's, he's done this fabulous twig hat for her. So the importance of something like this is, is not just a one-off, here we go, and, and it, it's a, a nice outcome, but actually what this then brings to each of them as practitioners, what he brings back from that to his work and in his studio, and also what she's taking on um, for her work as well as, as a fashion designer. So these kind of, this is the most, uh, I guess, uh, the most um, obvious type of collaboration where you have two disciplines that are not too far apart. So the language that each use is recognizable. They recognize one another's language and it's, it's of benefit and this is a cyclical thing that we start to see happening here. And this is another of a similar type of uh, collaboration, but it's where we're seeing um, makers moving across disciplines more and really pushing, pushing the dialogue and bringing the dialogue in. So it's less of a, a commission and it is more of uh, a movement to and fro in the process. So there is more of a learning going on. And that is a, a key reason to, to collaborate, is, is to learn and to add to your professional practice. And again, this is mostly happening in the atelier. The work that you're seeing on the left here, this is from Jan Taminau and the uh, Netherlands Textile Museum in Tilburg. <coughs> Excuse me. And what they're doing here is uh, they're tufting um, a dress. So this is a circular dress. And it's also reversible, it's interchangeable, it can be worn and used in many different ways. So you see the designer there with his uh, brown jacket on. But this was a constant toing and froing between Tilburg and the designer. And they're a very interesting museum. So as a practice, it, uh, their curating is, is quite strong in the way that it brings not just exhibitors in, exhibitions in, but actually sets up workshops to work with the people that they're going to exhibit. And then it sets up further workshops so that practitioners can come along during the exhibition or before the exhibition, and the learning process goes out to a wider audience there as well. So it's very much a dialogue, a, a, a discussion, and uh, a working process between the museum in a very practical way as well as conceptual way with many of the people that they exhibit. So I think that flags up really the changing nature of what a museum is, of, of what a gallery is, of what a, a, an exhibition is. And it's moving away from a simply, we will show your work, or here is some money, go away and, and do a commission. It is becoming much more integral to the working process of, uh, of the makers. And the, um, oh yes, I should say that um, Jan Tamina, um, he will be showing over at Tilburg from the 29th of September until the 27th of January. So there will be work from his collection that will be showing there. Some of it from the series that he did with Tilburg and then some wider pieces from uh, his collection also. The piece that you see on the <coughs> right there, that is Iris van Herpen's uh, work. And she is a Dutch designer. She's probably uh, the most, famous um, up-and-coming fashion designer coming from Holland at the moment. So she's just been having an exhibition uh, that's just closing at the moment, I think, over at the Groningen uh, Museum in, uh, in the Netherlands. And she's very experimental in the way that she works with materials. 
and by extension with materials and processes. And I think that it, it's very often forgotten that the, the process comes with the material. It isn't simply an off-the-shelf, here is a nice new you know, piece of textile or piece of ceramic. There you go. The process comes with it, and that's where the, the real collaboration often comes in. Because for something like this, the piece you're seeing there, it's an almost skeletal piece that comes to about here on the body and then down to a, a, a mini skirt. Um, and it's done with laser sintering that um, Rosie was mentioning uh, earlier and, and Minister mentioned as well as, as the future of, um, of technology and materials. And so laser sintering is a 3D printing process where you've got a machine, almost like your inkjet printer, which goes over and back and puts fine layers of material, building it up. Um, most commonly it's, uh, it's a nylon but lots of other materials can be used as well, um, including rubber um, and um, I believe some ceramic as well. But this is a nylon piece, so it's a, it's a hard nylon, so it's a kind of plastic kind of material. But this is one that she did with uh, ma materialized, and this is from her Caprio collection. So something like this, you know, she's got the concept. Um, the ideas come from skeletons and from the body and how things are, um, are, what our bodies look like with scanning electron micrographs. So she's also been working with scientists and with scientific photographers in particular to look at, uh, to look at the body, to exploit some of those materials, some of the, the invisible um, elements of the body that we can't see. So in her work, she's working with the scientists, she's working with the photographers, and then she's working with the software designers um, and to produce the CAD programs to actually design this. And this is quite a, an intricate process as well. And then they go and they're working with somebody like Materialize to actually make the piece. So something like this will take weeks to actually print out. It's not a, a quick press the button and print it out. And when I heard this, I, <coughs> excuse me, it, it reminded me of uh, the first time I used an Apple computer, which this is really dating me now, but anyway, it was an Apple SE, which was about this size. And I remember doing a rendering, which was just a line rendering. And it, I had to leave the machine running overnight to do a little line rendering. That was just, um, anyway, there, I've dated myself. Never mind. Um, so, it, it, but these things start with something like that. So, that something like this is taking weeks to actually print this out because it is so intricate, so sophisticated. But in five years' time, it will be at another place. It's also worth bearing in mind that uh, collaboration is important to prevent the demise of certain craft techniques. Um, this is the work of Tacita Dean, who showed at the Tate at the Turbine Hall, um, and this is her film from last year. And she is very uh, determined that she doesn't want to take the easy route and just go digital, because there's a quality to the 35 mil film that she wants to keep. She wants that quality in her work. And it seemed like an easy thing to do, but it wasn't, because when she went to go and make the film, um, and produce the film, and she wanted to keep in particular the, the sprockets, the little holes at either side. She found it increasingly difficult. The, the people she was working with in London were closing down, and they were told they couldn't work with a um, uh, small film like hers anymore, and she had to go over to Holland, and it was a huge involved process to try and do this. But she was determined she wanted that quality, the, the, quali the depth of image that she got with the 35 mil that she felt, and I still feel, I'm, uh, that the digital medium, although very convenient and wonderful, and I still miss my little slide carousel, um, uh, because I think that there was a depth to those images that we have lost with the digital. I think the digital image flattens it, and we're still waiting to get that, that richness um, from that, and actually, I'm digressing here, but Paramount Pictures, I, I was uh, speaking with one of the restorers from there, we were both giving a talk at the same conference, and he said that they're restoring onto film, not digital, because, um, because of the loss of quality if they restore it just digitally. So anyway, there we go, they're doing it. So with this, actually, to, to retain those sprockets, 
she ended up having to work with um, laser sintering technology to get something fine enough to give her those sprockets so that it would come out in, in the film. So it was, she was working with craftspeople in order to realize this. And for work of, of this magnitude and for this, uh, for this particular vision in the art, she has, you know, the, the craftsperson in industry has been a vital component to that. So we've got the craftsperson in their atelier in the studio, craftsperson in industry, different ways of working. And each of the narratives uh, that we, we see um, so far, each of them are different. There is no blueprint, there is no, here is how it is, here is how it's done, off you go. Life would be very simple if that was it, it would also be very boring. <clears throat> this is uh, some work that I saw at, at uh, an exhibition that really impressed me over the Crafts Council in, uh, in Dublin. Um, and this is the, uh, the work of um, Laura May. Um, and this is from an exhibition called Modern Languages, which toured as well and, and came over to the UK. Um, and what I like about her work is that she is looking at globalization instead of wringing her hands and saying, oh, we're losing all of our, our cultural identity to mass production, to IKEA, and you know, it's all gone and this is terrible. She has said, okay, well, what can we learn from this process? What can we take from that and bring back to our, our vision, our identity, our making process that will make us look again at what we're doing? And she has really explored that with the, uh, the Stefan chair, which is one of IKEA's cheap and cheerfuls, and then looking at the Sligo chair. And I think it's, it's, it's really being very positive about what you can also look at as a negative. You know, if you're a maker making a very simple, very uh, um, clean aesthetic chair, you are up against the IKEA one. You are up against the guy who will come in and say, well, it's all very well, but I, you know, why should I spend, you know, 200 pounds on you know, a chair when I can get one for 20 that looks the same for my IKEA. Um, and I know that it, I've seen it in the textile industry as well. Um, I was speaking to Jacob Schlepfer, to Martin, Martin Luthold a few years ago about this, and he said he was doing these fabulous haute couture um, fabrics for the Paris catwalks, so really intricate, embellished, um, laser cutting, it was also being embroidered, embossed, beautiful, stunning. Um, and he said he's up against the um, Zara and the Hennies who are doing laser cutting, you know, and it is the quality of material. If you put them in your hand, you don't even need to look at them to know that you've got two very different quality materials. But he's up against that um, because they are hijacking that process, can do it so cheaply, how does he make that mark of difference? How does the maker say, my chair is a, a mark of craftsmanship? There is something else that comes into that. How do you do that? What is, how do you imbue that knowledge, that making, that identity, that value into your, uh, into your product, into uh, what you've made? And that's what, uh, what she's exploring. So the, the chair on your right there, um, that is very beautiful, sort of corrugated um, effect on the chair and really exploring the, the movement and the shape of that. And this is another piece from the same exhibition. Um, and this was from Deirdre uh, Nelson. And this was where she'd taken um, an iron jumper and she, that she'd, uh, she'd bought on eBay, and then she'd unraveled it, and then re remade it. Um, so it was really hijacking the uh, the mass-produced product. So taking mass-produced and then repurposing that. And there is a lot of cultural hijacking. There's almost a reverse osmosis where you, you're seeing um, a growing number of of makers who are taking industrialized processes or um, globalized production or globalized making and say, okay, we're, we're going to, instead of them borrowing, taking, stealing and um, doing all sorts of terrible things to what we're doing, we can reverse it. We can um, actually take what they're doing and make it our own, make our, add our identity to that and make it modern and make it contemporary and make it meaningful so that conceptually 
it's starting to address the wider issues of making, of why a craft product, a craft object uh, is different, has got something that is different to the mass-produced one, how you can tell that. You, you can't put sticky labels on everything. It has to be imbued somehow. And increasingly, we're starting to see this happen conceptually. I'd like to talk a little bit on, on the social side of things now as well, because I'm, I mentioned at the beginning the, you know, the importance of our notion of value. So value, we, we tend to think of it in, in terms of monetary value, but increasingly there is a, an ethical and uh, moral value that is starting to be applied to, to production processes. Um, and uh, as Rosie said, my core area uh, is looking at advanced fashion. And the fashion industry is one in particular that has had to address very bad press coverage, very bad practice in terms of ethical production. So it's not just how something is, uh, is produced, but what we can bring to and what our responsibilities are to other makers as well. Uh, this is a project called Go Global from um, uh, the Royal College of Art, Industrial Design, Engineering Department where they take their students to a different country each year and explore cultural diversity, but also working with a, a lot of emerging economies as well. In this case, they were working with makers in Thailand and looking to work not just on the production, but also on the design. And this brought to mind, when, when I heard about this, um, a, an interview that I heard years ago with Anita Roddick about she was very distressed having worked uh, with some paper makers in India and she was bringing over some of their products to the body shop and her director said, well, we have to be careful that, you know, they don't just produce for us and make sure that they're producing for, you know, their existing market continuously as well. And she did remind them of that and she did say, do please keep your existing market. And of course they didn't because the body shop was the biggest um, order they'd ever had. And after a while, these products were not selling. And she said it was one of the worst things she had to do is to go back to that village and say, I'm really sorry, I can't continue to, to order this from you. And it, it did flag up um, you know, the difficulty of working with emerging economies and how, how you're perceived by them and the perceived relationship. It's one thing to be clear in your mind what the relationship is with other economies, other cultures that you were working with. But there's also the other side of being aware of what their perception is, which can be very different. <coughs> this is um, another laser sintering piece. Um, and this is Freedom of Creation. We did this wonderful shoe um, for Onitsuka Tiger. And it was about a meter five in, in length. Um, and had all these great visions of um, Tokyo and, and going through uh, the city and, and really beautifully detailed, fabulous piece. And they did gorgeous little USB um, holders as well of the same design. So they're doing a lot with all, they're collaborating with a lot of products, with a lot of jewelry designers, all sorts of people. And it's, for them, it, it, the excitement is in the learning process. Somebody comes to them who's maybe not worked with a process before, they bring something different. You know, there's certain rules and regulations that have to be made, but it brings something different um, to their knowledge and their um, experience of, of the technology and the working process. On the right, when I went to their office, um, they had just, one of them had just come back from uh, Indonesia, and they had brought back a tray. They'd, they'd brought out a tray which, of theirs, which is about so big, and they gave it to a wood maker, a wood turner, um, in Indonesia and said, right, can you try and make this? Because one of the interesting things with laser sintering is that it gives you the possibility for whole new structures. Um, and so the wood turner said, okay, and he went away. And it took him about two weeks to make it and nearly drove him mad, he said. But they weren't quite sure where it was going to go, but they quite liked the idea of rather than looking at a craft process or a traditional process and bringing it over to laser sintering and translating there, what happens if you reverse it? If you go from the laser sintering back to craft and say, here's a, you know, a, a structure that maybe you haven't produced before, now see what you can do with it. 
So I'm, I'm really watching this to see how it evolves and develops, and, and hopefully there will be a little bit of movement to and fro. We'll start to see um, craft informing the technology more. This is Stephen Burks, uh, a New York-based uh, designer, and he has been working um, out in Senegal in a village, craft village near Dakar. And he, his work highlights, this is from an exhibition that he had in Toronto earlier this year called Man Made, where he was working with the basket makers and reinterpreting their baskets. So the piece you're seeing on, uh, at the forefront that is a basket placed on the wall with a mirror in front, so the, the image is a reflection. And then next to it, he's put a shelf in so that it becomes a shelf. So he is repurposing, and it's, it's very kind of do shelf almost in its ready-made um, approach to it. It's also um, quite controversial in that some people say, well, this is fabulous, it's wonderful, they're one-off pieces, making us look again at, at baskets. And other people say, well, where is the design process in terms of collaboration? You know, where is the Senegalese um, maker's input to this? Because it, they look like they're regular um, plastic and also uh, seagrass baskets. So what is the nature of collaboration? Is it simply appropriating another culture's uh, product? and? adding your particular vision to that, adding your culture to it, or is it more of a two-way process? And does it have to be a two-way process? Can it, be, can it be something like this? And that is, that is one way of doing it. Um, and we've also got another. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is what's supposed to be on this week, but it's um, happening in uh, October 3rd now I believe is opening and this is from Patty Johnson and this is Voodoo Nouveau and she's been working with her North South um, uh, program with a lot of makers in emerging economies for um, in terms of producing work this has been done down in Haiti and these are rubber it's made from recycled rubber and these are wall pieces so she's been doing a whole body of work with people in Haiti going down and working with them. So the, the work has been produced down there. The, the motifs, the designs, it's a dialogue between the two. Because these are coming up to, Selfridges are coming up to uh, New York. So they have to find a Western market. So there has been a dialogue. What, what should the motifs be? How can they be translated so that it is meaningful for the market because they want to sell them and earn some money, reasonably enough. going a bit too fast. Um, this is uh, looking a little bit at uh, the environmental side of things. So this is Helen's story. And increasingly with technology, you can't know it all. As a consultant, I, I am there because, you know, whether it's a manufacturer, whether it's a designer, the architect, whoever, they don't have all the information. So that's how I get a job, you know. <laughs> I've got certain bits that I can add in. I don't have all the information. So increasingly we're starting to see people collaborate because they need to add to their existing knowledge and they need to bring in the experts. It doesn't make sense to be an expert in everything. Um, and the nature of technology is that it is becoming so, uh, so involved and so sophisticated and changes so quickly, it's just not, not possible. So Helen Story has been collaborating um, in the production of her catalytic clothing. And what this does is rather than uh, a garment adding to its environmental impact, this is actually cleaning the environment. So it's cleaning pollutants from the air as you wear it. And the same technology is also being applied to, um, to buildings, to architecture as well. There's been, uh, MoMA had their installation in the summer with a, a building that had the same coating. So the building was cleaning the air around it, which is very nice. It, I think we needed a bit more than the one building in New York though, to do that. Um, and this again is, is looking from an environmental point of view. And this is the tactility factory. And they, I think, exhibited here at the RIBA not so long ago. 
And again, this is bringing together a textile designer, uh, Trish Belfer, that you see there, with an architect, and bringing the two minds, the two different thinking processes together, because the approach in making what you're seeing here on the right, which is ceramic, which is it's not ceramic, sorry, uh, which is concrete with textile, it's adding to um, the nature of concrete as being a, a very kind of um, cold, um, material that doesn't invite touch. By adding textile, it's inviting touch, um, and it's also adding to the longevity of the material so that you don't have to paint it so often. The weathering, the aging process becomes part of it um, and part of the aesthetic, and that's a very difficult thing with a lot of uh, modern materials, unlike wood, beautiful wood here, the aging is part of that. With a lot of plastics, for instance, once it starts to age, people just want to get rid of it. Oh, did I skip on? Oh, no. Oh. Okay. There we go. Um, this is another collaboration. This is Art Center Pasadena. Um, and the original building um, has had an extension. And this was using uh, transparent um, um, ETFE uh, film, which is the sort that's used at the Millennium, uh, not Millennium Dome, the, um, the Eden Center, and also at the Water Cube for Beijing. But they needed to have some protection from the sun because it's right up on a hill in Pasadena. So the architects went to uh, the graphic designer, Bruce Mao, and they said, right, we want you to design a pattern so that we can get shade um, whilst uh, it's in the heat of the, sh heat of the, the day. And so the pattern actually creates a dappled effect inside and protects people working inside from having the glaring sun. And then in the evening, they get the light through. And that's quite a beautiful thing. So the idea of an architect working with a graphic designer as, uh, as opposed to uh, a, a, a print designer has added something different to that, that process. And Bruce Mao himself is very involved in environmental issues and keen to reduce our carbon footprint. And this is from uh, Grado Zero Spas, because we're seeing a lot with um, space industry starting to filter down into our um, economies and a much more speedy process than it used to be. So instead of it taking 20 or 25 years for a technology or a process to come through, we're starting to see it in as little as five years, and this is great. So this is um, aerogel used by Grado Zero Spas, looking for commercial applications for space technologies. And this is a partly an economic side of things. So this is an economic value um, that it can reach commercialization more quickly and start bringing revenue for the European Space Agency. And in this work, this is a project that I, I took part in. Um, I was a speaker and this was a wonderful conference called Smart Geometry 2012 in Troy in New York. Um, and this is all about collaboration making, and it was fabulous for me to go along. It was mostly architects, um, and they were looking at a lot of digital, because smart geometry, a lot of it was digital, uh, but it was all about the making. And here what we're seeing was a, one of the, the workshops that took part beforehand. Uh, they brought along a computer robot with an arm on it. So the computer was interacting with the people, so you had a mixture of the makers making these wonderful um, uh, ceramic panels for, uh, for buildings, and the, the robot was doing some of the manufacturing. And you can see on the left here, you've got a human, and he's got his hand down, and he's, he's manipulating the clay with the robot as well. So it's a real human-machine interaction. Um, but what it allowed them to do was to produce bespoke elements um, that combined the, the technological, the speed of the technological process, but with the handcraft element to it. Um, now, Smart Geometry 2012 is, a, a, so Smart Geometry is, I believe, coming to London next year, or at least that was the plan. And I would really recommend keeping your eyes peeled for that, because they will also be looking, putting out a call for people to come and do workshops which you can do in collaboration. So very often there was maybe an architect, an engineer, a maker involved in that. Um, and that was a really wonderful event. And um, I, would, I would really recommend uh, checking that out. So that was 
um, March, April of last year, so I'm guessing March, April this year as well. And I guess, really, in terms of scale, um, that is one of the things that we're starting to see happening uh, with with some of these collaborations. This is Tokujin Yoshioko, and this is his waterfall, which uses optical glass from the space industry. So without that technological space industry um, link, he just would not have been able to produce something of this quality. And if you look, if you go down sideways and look through the glass, it's absolutely crystal clear to the other end. It is just such a, technically, aesthetically, in terms of the making, it's just a very simple, very beautiful piece that really came together. <coughs> and the image on the right is one that just where I put the camera down over the top of it and just photographed it. It was just a stunning, stunningly beautiful, very simple uh, piece of work. And he showed that in Sydney at the um, Gene Sherman Foundation. I'm going to do a few quickly of my projects because I see I'm running out of time. Um, Really, I suppose I first came to this idea of collaboration through the high-tech, low-tech project um, that was uh, took part here, and that was a Crafts for Now consortium. So that was a collaboration between uh, different um, galleries, including the Devon Guild of Craftsmen that were mentioned earlier. Um, and this was looking at how people can, how makers can collaborate with industry, and it was a very interesting process in in its uh, in the way that. Um, the collaborations came came to light. This was Julie Keat, who is a jewellery maker, making tiny pieces of jewellery. And I decided when I was commissioning her to work with a company to be a bit naughty, and I commissioned her to work with a non-wovens industry who worked really large scale with really cheap material to see what would happen when she was pushed out of her comfort zone of, of very small, beautiful pieces to very large scale pieces. And the result is what you see here on the right, with these very large-scale, fabulous wall hangings, which was really great to have. And this is um, Sophie Road, who worked with uh, industry uh, CS Interglass, who normally make uh, glass fibre and then have metallized coating on that. Um, and she made these three-dimensional uh, fabrics that could be shaped and formed. And they were last looking at, at trying to put that into production for interiors. And this was from uh, another project where, again, it was with the Tilburg Textile Museum, but also with the Ceramics Research Centre. And this was quite a nice, this is Hildreson. This is quite a nice coming together of different institutions that wouldn't normally work together, so ceramics and textiles. And there was a value for both of them in that. And again, a dialogue, a movement to and fro that uh, that led to some, some very interesting work. With the, the ceramic pieces were crocheted and then glazed and then fired, and then that was used as a basis for uh, scanning in and a textile pattern, which became a jacquard weave. And then the chair you see over there was co with Constantine Greech, um, the furniture designer. And again, this is quite a nice uh, project in that it came from an event a bit like this. Uh, a number of years ago that um, Beatrice Stark, who's here, um, hello Beatrice, uh, was there. And uh, this is from a Crafts Council exhibition 2012, and it was down at Tilburg. And the furniture designer, Marcel Wonders, was sitting next to an aerospace engineer professor from Delft University. They got chatting, uh, let's do something together. And the result was, um, Marcel Wonder's chair, his knotted chair, macrame chair. So in environments like this, you don't know who you're sitting next to, so do, do chat to not just the people that you know, but the people you don't know. Um, and this went into production um, uh, with Capellini and its one design prizes. And it was a very interesting working experience, collaboration experience for both of them. This is happening down the road at the moment, the piece on, on the right, which is Ili Kishimoto. And when I first met them, they were doing uh, prints, they had done a pixelated print for Hussein Chilean. And when I met with them, I said, so you've been using some computers, and this is the early 90s. And they said, no, it's all done on a photocopying machine. Um, so they were taking the aesthetic of technology and using low-tech to realize that. 
and now they've been doing their flash print here and they've been exploring, re-exploring, and a lot of the re-exploring is through collaboration. And the most recent one is what you see over there, and that was with Clarks, that's coming out next year. And their exhibition is down in Drury Lane, and it's just opened last night. Um, and they've also got fabulous lace. The white you see there is, is <coughs> lace that they've made, and ceramics as well. It's all collaboration. It's all reiterations, re-exploring, their own work through collaboration. Um, and this is another uh, designer that I worked with a number of years ago with, with the Fabric of Fashion exhibition. Um, and this is Karen Nichol, who did this beautiful twine embroidery for Tracy Mulligan. And this kind of collaboration is then explored and, and furthered and informs her own work. And this is her most recent work over here with the, the monkey. And I love the fact he's got his, his love-hate little thing on his, um, on his paws. It reminds me of that Robert Mitchum film. So collaboration then goes back, as we said, with the earlier piece with, um, uh, with the basket ray. It does inform maker's own practice. And education is somewhere that I think that we've really got to explore further because this is, this is a project I did in Sydney uh, with students there, multidisciplinary students, where we were looking at uh, graphic design, product design, textile design. And this is Waste in the City project. So we had infographics looking at a particular area of, uh, of Sydney, exploring the waste there, and then producing product from that, uh, which was a little coffee cup that could then be recycled to produce little plants in public garden. And I, hopefully I've got a, a video coming up here. Or the video's not going, is it? No. Oh, OK, OK. Um, I thought I would end on the coffee video, but never mind, because we're coming up to coffee time. Um, so, but the, just going back briefly to that one, I mean, the important thing that I found coming out of that was in talking to the students afterwards, what what was, did you gain out of it? And they said the learning process. What we learned from the way that a graphic designer works, a textile designer was saying what I can learn from a graphic designer, the way they think, the way they work, um, and vice versa. Um, so this was very good to hear, very important to hear. But it's also quite challenging in our current education system, our third level education system, because the nature of grading and achievement is that it's measurable on the individual. And that is quite restrictive. You, you can only do a certain amount of this. And yet when makers go out and designers go out into industry and go out into working, as you see from all of this, and, and I know there'll be a lot of projects in the room here as well, you rarely work in isolation. You have to at least work with the client or your you know, uh, gallery or, or whoever. You don't work in isolation. And the education system, I feel very strongly, has to uh, take this into account much more uh, than it does at present. And I'm just going to conclude with a pack of good ideas, which was uh, a project that um, uh, uh, Tom Barker, who is a professor of industrial design engineering at the Royal College of Art, did a few years ago where he commissioned a graphic designer to come up with a series of cards um, on good ideas. And some of those were about collaboration and why you collaborate. And I like this because in itself it is also a collaboration in that he just gave her the, uh, the, the one-liners and she then had to reinterpret. She was from Korea, I think. Um, and she had to reinterpret. So some of them made absolute sense and then others, it was a very different cultural take on what we might imagine uh, in, in the UK on this. So um, why we collaborate? We collaborate to learn. The learning process is fundamental. It's not just about the end product that we get from working or with, um, with another area in particular. We have to learn. What can we learn from each other? Uh, we collaborate to build our capability. You know, we can't do everything ourselves. The big companies, you, you know, the uh, you know the Nikes, whatever, they can't do everything themselves. They have to bring in people that are specialists, and craftspeople are specialists. In taking part in the the collaboration process, it's important to listen. 
as much as be listened to. We, we very often forget that it's not just about communicating our ideas and our thoughts, but it's also listening and not just waiting to get in with the next bit on, on yours. So the, the really successful ones are where people have listened, and that's often challenging. Really important, park the ego. The number of times I've seen things go wrong because the ego has not been parked <laughs> is heinous, it's horrible, and it's not a pretty sight. Um, and this one I like just because I'm Irish. Um, it says, the Irish are lucky they created, but it, it, I, I wanted to end with a, a story of, of my particular piece of luck, um, which was that uh, Sarah Braddock Clark and myself we had the idea of doing an exhibition of the impact of technology on textiles in the early 90s. And we sat up at the Crafts Council on Pentonville Road in their library doing some research on this. And we're chatting and like, you know, what should we do? Where, you know, who should we include? Whatever, where will it be? And we had no venue, we had nobody. We just had an idea. And somebody from the Crafts Council came in and overheard us, eavesdropped and said, uh, where are you doing this show? It sounds interesting. I said, well, we haven't got anyone. We just want to do this. And they said, well, come and do it for us. <laughs> so it, I mean, that was luck. But I also don't believe in luck. I, also, I believe that we do have to make our own, uh, our own possibilities. Uh, we have to be open to possibilities as they emerge. And I think that it, it is important to have that, that openness and also that hunger to actually see when the possibilities for collaboration, when the value of collaboration comes up. It may be a different value to the one that we, we anticipate or the one that we would normally expect and want, but, uh, but being open to that is, is <coughs> where the opportunities, the new things, the different things, and the exciting things, the things that make it wonderful to be involved in craft start to emerge. Thank you very much. <laughs>